Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. And with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Welcome, everybody. I hope that the music is over and that, because it's ridiculous, but we can't, the host can't tell when the commercial break is over. And so I'm hoping that it is. And I'm going to go ahead and start the show. I still hear a loud buzzing, and so I'll give it one more minute and see if that recedes. All right, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks, Laura, for the heads up on all that. Um, Still tremendous noise, but I'm hoping that it's not bleeding over and you can't hear that. Um, I'll just have to kind of remove it and and just deal with it. But uh, we appreciate all of you taking the time to join us this evening. I do have a very interesting show lined up for you. I'm going to be speaking about some end time studies that I had put together and which I had shared with the those of you that follow and that listen to and keep up with our posts on Facebook. I shared and released a portion of the Apocalypse of Thomas, which is also one of those um, similar to Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13, which, in my opinion, there are a number of different a number of different um, gospels out there and available, which most people are not familiar with and which most have not studied. And so, I'm going to cover some of that. Okay, great. Thank you, Laura. And what it's very important to know about these other, in my opinion, gospel narratives because they provide further detail on some of the things which may remain ambiguous within the gospel accounts as we have them within the New Testament. For instance, you know, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but we are told that even the apostles number 12 and the things that they wrote, why are they not included in the canonical materials? You know, and those people that were closest to Yeshua, for instance, like Thomas and like James, even though we have one book of James, there are numerous texts dedicated to James and to Thomas, and none of them are included in the the canonical materials. And yet, a lot of what they wrote and what has been criticized as being pseudepigraphal or, you know, other authored by other people are manuscripts which flow directly in line with what is spoken about in some portions of the gospel narrative. And so, you know, who differentiated what was authorized and what wasn't? These different councils and uh, why was it that they decided, because 
these texts also date back to the early church and the Gospel of Thomas is said to be uh, even older than some of the other manuscripts which we have as part of the canonical materials. And so um, myself, I tend to not believe the different authorities that decided for the masses that this was okay and this wasn't, and that this should be read and this shouldn't. Because again, in the history of truth and prophecy, most has been hidden and excluded and kept away from the inquisitiveness of the public at large. And they tried to the seat of the serpent, which in my opinion has been waging war against the seed of Adam since the garden and have at every turn of the way been trying to steal, distort, contort, um, and take over and filter and control what is and what should be and what could be read by truth seekers. And so I, I don't trust any professional opinion. And when somebody tells me that this shouldn't be read or this shouldn't be studied and they can't give me a, a, a good reason as to why, I'm certainly going to examine it in fullness and decide for myself, you know, whether it is um, beneficial to my study on the gospel narrative and the prophetic word. Because, again, in my study of many, much of these ancient manuscripts, I have found many of them to be greatly beneficial for better understanding on so much what of what has been kept hidden and excluded and extricated from the, again, approved and authorized texts. And so that's why I study everything that I can, and I encourage others to do the same. And it's it's really, to me, it's just a sign of ignorance when somebody comes on and comments on the different manuscripts or the different shows or the different teachings that I bring forth, and all they do is condemn and criticize and say, oh, this tech is Gnostic or this text is you know, whatever negative connotation they tried to associate with it, and yet they've never even read it or studied it for themselves. And they can't give you a good answer as to why they consider it to be Gnostic or New Age or whatever it is that they want to put on it as being derogatory, which Gnostic, when you study the word itself, it just means wisdom, knowledge, light, and secretive knowledge. And, you know, which is what a lot of the texts, as I showed in the show that I did on the secret teachings, just a couple of weeks back, maybe even just a week back, that even in the book of Enoch, in the book of Esdras, which was part of the apocryphal materials, which have also been excluded from the authorized and approve uh, text, even though it was originally part of the 81-book canon of the King James Version of the Bible, um, it shows and brings forth that there were teachings which the Most High, one-third, in fact, of the 200 and something manuscripts that came out, 70 of them, were told to Ezra, the Most High God told Ezra to preserve them for the elect alone. And so that's a large portion of the manuscripts. 
And even in what we find now with the fullness of the biblical material, including the extra biblical text, one third of seemingly the entirety of what is written has been written for this generation, with our being the fig tree, in my opinion, the fig tree generation, that generation which would see all things revealed and coming to light. And that Christ said, and as I will cover this evening, that the fig tree is connected to the blooming of the fig tree, which again is the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. And that's part of the Apocalypse of Peter, which we will also examine. But um, even the Apocalypse of Peter flows in line, a portion of it, the portion that I'm going to cover this evening, specifically with what it reveals in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 where those apostles bring forth in discourse as to what they were told when they asked Christ about the signs of his return and of the end of the age. And so we will examine that too, but I'm going to start with the Apocalypse of Thomas. And we're going to go ahead and get into it because I want to bring forth in Revelation a lot of material this evening to give you a better understanding on the end times, as well as, you know, what Christ said and revealed to the other apostles. And specific, we're going to be looking at the Apocalypse of Thomas and the Apocalypse of Peter which are part of the Great Commission, the books of the Great Commission 3, which are on the end-time apocalypses. And probably this will end up being a series because I've got so much information that I would like to share with you on this particular issue and this particular topic. And I'd like to also go into some of what is revealed within Scripture with regard to Revelation and the Revelation of St. John the Theologian, which is one of my most favorite extra-biblical texts, and one that very few um, people have even heard about, much less read and studied. And it's one of those texts which I absolutely love because it gives great detail on the timeline of the end of days and one does not have to try to decipher parable or to make sense of what could be symbolic or deeply metaphorical language. All right, and so, beginning, the Apocalypse of Thomas. Here beginneth the epistle of the Lord unto Thomas. Hear thou, Thomas, the things which must come to pass in the last times. There shall be famine and war and earthquakes in diverse places. Snow and ice and great drought shall there be in many dissensions among the peoples. Blasphemy, iniquity, envy, and villainy, indolence, pride, and intemperance, so that every man shall speak that which pleaseth him. And my priests shall not have peace among themselves, but shall sacrifice unto me with deceitful mind. Therefore will I not look upon them. Then shall the priest behold the people departing from the house of the Lord and turning unto the world and setting up and transgressing landmarks in the house of God. And they shall claim and vindicate for themselves many things and places that were lost and 
that shall be subject unto Caesar, as also they were aforetime, giving poll taxes to cities, even gold and silver, and the chief men of the city shall be condemned, and their substance brought into the treasury of the kings, and they shall be filled. Um, just a comment. I mean, is that not what we are seeing? In, in these times now, with so many people leaving the mainstream churches, and especially this generation, the children um, that are dissatisfied with religion and with spirituality and with what they what seems empty worship to them. And they have no respect for the, especially the Catholic priests that are pedophiles and that the church has protected and kept from being prosecuted for their crimes. There's no sanctity, no respect and no honor for these so-called vicars, you know, these intercessiaries that are that the people are supposed to look to for guidance and direction. In fact, there's utter just anger and hatred for a lot of these religious institutions. And many children are flooding away to what are ancient pagan um, religions and, you know, these renewed and restored New Age teachings and belief systems. And so, you know, Christ tells us here that this would happen and it would be a sign of the end of days. All right, continuing. For there shall be great disturbance throughout all the people and death. The house of the Lord shall be desolate, and their altars shall be abhorred, so that spiders weave their webs therein. The place of holiness shall be corrupted, the priesthood polluted. Distress, agony shall increase, virtue shall be overcome, joy perish, and gladness depart. In those days evil shall abound. There shall be respecters of persons. Him shall cease out of the house of the Lord. Truth shall be no more. Covetousness shall abound among the priests. And upright men shall not be found. And so, you know, we see that even though there's a church on every corner, just about, and yet, there are homeless people everywhere in all the cities of America starving and dying of heat and cold, not safe in the you know the systems that have been created to serve them, and so. It's insanity. And then the other thing is, look at how much food is daily thrown away by the buffets and those that you know sell food on in every city, just every corner, really. That all of that food could really go to feed probably the entirety of all those that are starving in the world today that really there's no sense for starvation. It's a, it's a created condition. And if we truly cared for one another and looked after each other, there would be, there would be no starvation. There would be no suffering in the manner as we see it today. Continuing. 
After that shall arise another king, a crafty man, who shall hold rule for a short space, in whose days there shall be all manner of evils, even the death of the race of men from the east even unto Babylon. And thereafter death and famine and sword in the land of Canaan, even unto Rome. Then shall all the fountains of the waters and wells boil over and be turned into blood or into dust and blood. The heaven shall be moved, the stars shall fall upon the earth, the sun shall be cut in half like the moon, and the moon shall not give her light. There shall be great signs and wonders in those days when Antichrist draweth near. These are the signs unto them that dwell in the earth. Also, I'd like to state that I excluded a large portion of the text because um, it does make mention of, you know, like the vision of Daniel, the different kingdoms that arise to power and the different kings that come to be in charge during certain aspects of prophecy. But I'm skipping down to, you know, our generation and to that which affects and is associated to what we would see and what we would go through in this day and age. All right, continuing. In those days when Antichrist now draweth near, these are the signs. Woe unto them that dwell on the earth in those days, great pains of travail shall come upon them. Woe unto them that build, for they shall not inhabit. Woe unto them that break up the fallow, for they shall labor without cause. Woe unto them that make marriages, for unto famine and need shall they beget sons. Woe unto them that join house to house, or field to field, for all things shall be consumed with fire. Woe unto them that look not unto themselves, while time alloweth, for hereafter shall they be condemned forever. Woe unto them that turn away from the poor when he asketh. Hear thou, O Thomas, for I am the Son of God, the Father, and I am the Father of all spirits. Hear thou of me the signs which shall come to pass at the end of this world, when the end of the world shall be fulfilled, that it pass away before my elect depart out of the world. Okay, I think this is very important because, as you know, I teach and reveal that at the end of days, before Christ returneth, and before he descends here to the earth and New Jerusalem settles out of the heavens, that part of the wrath of God being poured out on the wicked is that there will be the recreation of a new heaven and a new earth, and that the earth will be destroyed by the stars crashing down to the earth and setting everything ablaze, that the mountains will be brought low, and the heavens, I mean the seas brought high, so that all thing is recreated and made flat. And I've talked about this in great detail, and I've showed you in teaching and in scripture with the extra biblical text um, that this is what is revealed within scripture as well. And for those that have, don't know what I'm talking about, have not studied it in great detail, look to specifically the stars crashing to the earth, Endeavor Freedom. And you'll find the study and the teaching that I've brought and shared on this. Uh, because again, here it says, Hear thou of me the signs which shall come to pass at the end of this world, when the end of the world shall be fulfilled, that it pass away. And so the end of days and the end of this world is when the heavens and the earth are destroyed and recreated. That's when the end of this age is. And then it is restored for what will be the millennial reign. And it's not at the end of the great white throne judgment, you know, at the end of the millennial reign, 
But this is the judgment where the harvest, when Christ comes again in second advent, and the wicked are judged and destroyed, and then um, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, and then, um, you know, those that are the terrorists will be condemned, and those that are worthy of entering into rest for these thousand years of the Sabbath rest, that's when, you know, they will be worthy of being numbered and counted among the elect. And so the world will be destroyed at the end of these days and, the, and this generation and not after the millennial reign. And I'll, I'll prove that with scripture as well. And so one more time. Hear thou of me the signs which shall come to pass at the end of this world, when the end of the world shall be fulfilled that it pass away, before mine elect depart out of the world. I will tell thee that which shall come to pass openly unto men, but when these things shall be, the princes of the angels know not, seeing it is now hidden from before. And so here, uh, Christ is t saying that he's going to reveal it to the prophets and to the apostles. But in the angels of this world, the new world order, the powers, the principalities, the rulers of darkness, they um, do not know. And they have no idea as to how it will go down, how it will be fulfilled. And, um, you know, that their judgment is coming. All right, continue. Then shall there be in the world sharings, participations between king and king, and in all the earth shall be great famine, great pestilences, and many distresses. And the sons of men shall be led captive among all nations, and shall fall by the edge of the sword. And there shall be great commotion in the world. Then after that, when the hour of the end draweth nigh, there shall be for seven days great signs in heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be moved. Now let me stop here for a second, because as you can tell, the, the, this paragraph and the previous paragraph, they fit right along with what is revealed in Matthew 24 and uh, Luke 21, specifically, as I will share. But also know that the Apocalypse of Thomas references that great and terrible day of the Lord, which is, you know, spoken about in much prophecy all throughout the apocalyptic texts and the end time manuscripts. It speaks about how um, that is specific that the great and terrible day of the Lord will be actually a week's time and that it will conclude in seven days rather than in a single day, which is interesting. And I'll cover that in more gre in greater detail here shortly, but I want to share a couple of passages from Matthew 24 and Luke 21, which also fit in line with what I just spoke about. It says, And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them, but we ye shall hear of wars and commotions. Be not terrified, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences and fearful sights. And great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these they shall lay their hands on you, 
and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. And so is this not exactly what Christ said? When the end of the world shall be fulfilled, that it pass away before mine elect depart out of the world. So, all right, Matthew 24. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and thou shalt deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. And shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Matthew 24. All right, continuing. With the gospel of the apocalypse of Thomas. Then shall there be on the first day of the beginnings. At the first day of the beginning, at the third hour of the day, a great and mighty voice in the firmament of heaven, and a bloody cloud coming down out of the north, and great thunderings and mighty lightnings shall follow it, and it shall cover the whole heaven, and there shall be a rain of blood upon all the earth. These are the signs of the first day. Remember in scripture where it talks about how everything will be turned to blood, that the rivers shall be blood. In my opinion, it is this dust that accompanies the return of what is cited in scripture as wormwood or uh, what is called in the Colburn Bible the destroyer. Which later, uh, I'll be going into the Colburn Bible prophecies as well. It, it won't be on this show, but it will be part of this series. And on the second day, there shall be a great voice in the firmament of heaven, and the earth shall be moved out of its place, and the gates of heaven shall be opened in the firmament of heaven toward the east, and the smoke of a great fire shall break forth through the gates of heaven and shall cover all the heaven until evening. In that day there shall be fears and great terrors in the world. These are the signs of the second day. And so notice that, you know, these things are also associated with what Isaiah says, that the heaven shall depart like a scroll. And that it is when the gates of the firmament, as it speaks about here, are opened that Christ will descend and New Jerusalem also will descend out of the north. Because, again, as I share in paradise and the sides of the north and the mount of the congregation, <laughs> it is in the north where Polaris is that the Most High has established his throne room. And that where New Jerusalem and the place of the righteous is right now. And some of this will be revealed in the Apocalypse of Peter, which we will get to next. Probably in the second era. All right, continue. But on the third day, about the third hour, shall be a great voice in heaven, and the abysses of the earth shall roar from the four corners of the world. 
the pinnacles of the firmament of heaven shall be opened, and all of the air shall be filled with pillars of smoke. There shall be a stench of brimstone, very evil, until the tenth hour, and men shall say, We think the time draweth nigh that we perish. These are the signs of the third day. And on the fourth day, at the first hour, from the land of the east, the abyss shall melt so and roar. Then shall all the earth be shaken by the might of an earthquake. In that day the ornaments of the heathen shall fall, and all the buildings of the earth before the might of the earthquake. These are the signs of the fourth day. Also remember in scripture where it says that there will be a mighty earthquake and all the buildings of the world shall fall. An earthquake which has not been ever before and that will split Mount Sinai into two. This is what is revealed. <clears throat> On the fifth day at the sixth hour suddenly there shall be a great thunder in heaven and the powers of light and the wheel of the sun shall be caught away and there shall be great darkness in the world until evening and the air shall be gloomy without sun or moon and the stars shall cease from their ministry in that day shall all nations behold as in a mirror sackcloth and shall despise the life of this world these are the signs of the fifth day and on the sixth day, at the fourth hour, there shall be a great voice in heaven. And the firmament of heaven shall be cloven from the east unto the west. And the angels of the heaven shall be looking forth upon the earth by the openings of the heavens. And all these that are on the earth shall behold the host of the angels looking forth out of heaven. Then shall all men flee into the mountains and hide themselves from the face of the righteous angels, and say, Would that the earth would open and swallow us up, and such things shall come to pass, as never were since this world was created. Then shall they behold me coming from above in the light of my Father with the power and honor of the holy angels. Then at my coming shall the fence of fire of paradise be done away, because paradise is girt round about with fire. And this shall be that perpetual fire that shall consume the earth and all the elements of the world. And so you see that with the return of Christ, that the earth is going to be destroyed, and that's going to be part of the judgment brought upon the wicked and those not written into the books of life and the stars crashing to the earth that's going to be part of what sets it ablaze then shall the spirits and souls of all men come forth from paradise and shall come upon all the earth and every one of them shall go unto his own body where it is laid up and every one of them shall say here lieth my body, and when the great voice of those spirits shall be heard, then shall there be a great earthquake over all the world. And by the might thereof the mountains shall be cloven from above, and the rocks from beneath. There, Then shall every spirit return to his own vessel, and the bodies of the saints which have fallen asleep shall arise. And so we see that, you know, after the elements of the world, the fire consumeth the earth, it is destroyed. Then, and this is after all of mankind is also uh, killed in the destruction. Then the saints that were resurrected with Christ during the first resurrection, when he died on the cross and took to paradise, Adam and his righteous descendants as the resurrected first fruits, they will come down with New Jerusalem here to the earth. And again, this is after it is recreated, destroyed in what 
Second uh, Peter cites as the destruction by fire because he tells us of two times where the world will be destroyed. Once was by water and the second will be by fire. All right, continue. Then shall their bodies be changed into the image and likeness and the honor of the holy angels and into the power of the image of mine holy father. Then shall they be clothed with the vesture of life eternal out of the cloud of light which hath never been seen in this world. For that cloud cometh down out of the highest realm of the heaven from the power of my father. And that cloud shall compass about with the beauty thereof all the spirits that have believed in me. All right. Remember I, I told you that we were once bright-natured, immortal, and angelic beings? Well, does it not say here, Then shall their bodies be changed into the image and likeness and the honor of the holy angels, and into the power of the image of mine holy Father? Then shall they be clothed with the vesture of life eternal, out of the cloud of light which hath never been seen in this world? For that cloud cometh down out of the highest realm of the heavens from the power of my Father. And so, you know, we are going to be restored back to our immortal bright nature. Because, again, we were once the sons of God. And that we are still, even now, angelic beings just caught up in flesh form. But that part of us that is trapped in the flesh now is that immortal aspect of our, you know, of our spiritual selves that is immortal and that was with the Father and the Son before entering into the flesh, which is, you know, they knew us before even the foundations of this world. And we pre-existed with them before even the world was created which is exactly what scripture says, but which so many people oppose and nobody else teaches. Very few, I should say. Then shall they be clothed and shall be born by the hand of the holy angels, like as I have told you aforetime. Then also shall they be lifted up into the air upon a cloud of light, and shall go with me rejoicing unto heaven. And then shall they continue in the light and the honor of my Father. Then shall there be unto them great gladness with my Father and before the holy angels. These are the signs of the sixth day. And on the seventh day, at the eighth hour, there shall be voices in the four corners of the heaven. And all the air shall be shaken and filled with holy angels and they shall make war among them all the day long. And in that day shall mine elect be sought out by the holy angels from the destruction of the world. Then shall all men see that the hour of their destruction draweth near. These are the signs of the seventh day. Remember that, as I showed you, that right when the trump is sounded for what is the, it says, and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. And the mighty angels come to war against the fallen angels and the New World Order elites, which have established and set all the, war, uh, all the nations of the world against Israel. And that are prepared to fight against the return of Christ. This is when the elect are protected from what is coming upon the earth. And so not, you know, a pre-tribulation rapture, but right before the wrath of God is poured out on the wicked, which is on the very last day. Because even in this, as Thomas says, the unfolding of what is the great and terrible day of the Lord over the course of the week, it is on that very last day that the 
the righteous are protected and the wrath of God poured out on the wicked and those not written into the books of life. And so the scenario is similar, always. All right, continuing. And when the seven days are passed by, on the eighth day at the sixth hour, there shall be a sweet and tender voice in heaven from the east. Then shall that angel be revealed, which hath power over the holy angels, and all the ill angels shall go forth with him, sitting upon chariots of the clouds of mine holy Father, so rejoicing and running upon the air beneath the heaven, to deliver the elect that have believed in me. And they shall rejoice that the destruction of this world hath come. The words of the Savior unto Thomas are ended concerning the end of the world. And so I want to quickly share with you before we go to break. A portion of Revelation where it talks about how the earth and the heaven being fled away, that this is when Christ comes for and takes the judgment seat. And remember, this is before the millennial reign, because it is the harvest at the end of this world which determines who will be numbered among the elect and worthy of being preserved with the wheat. And the majority will be counted with the tares and those that are not written into the books of life. And, you know, I'm sorry to say it, but that's what Scripture reveals. All right, so continue. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which was in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. Yes, you see, people say that all they have to do is accept, you know, Christ as Savior and Messiah, and they don't have to do anything else. You are judged by your works, by what is written in the books of life. And what is written in the books of life are your actions, your behaviors, your decisions, your intent, and the things that you did while you were here on the earth. And whether you took care of the orphan, the widow, the poor, the needy, the naked, all those things which we are told uh, and instructed to do, those are the things which will determine whether you will be uh, counted in the salvation that Christ so generously extends to all of us. And so again, which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which was in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So here, before New Jerusalem descends out of the heavens and becomes the resting place for the elect for what will be the millennial reign, 
there will be a new heaven and a new earth. It's not at the end of the millennial reign. It's before. And it's when Christ comes again in the second advent. And it's clear in scripture once you understand. So continuing. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is for the wedding feast. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end, I will give unto them that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues. See, this is right before the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the wicked. And, God, and John is seeing a vision of what will happen thereafter and how there will be a new heaven and a new earth after the destruction of that is about to come and that Christ will be will come down with New Jerusalem and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, continue. Which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. And talk with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee Listen, the bride, the lamb, the wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city. All right, welcome back, everybody, for a second hour. I do want to uh, just thank all of you, those of you that do support the network. If you would like to donate to this platform, and because we are a corporate free and commercial free, as far as um, mostly commercial free network, uh, and then we are listener supported, uh, we do depend on. Uh, the proceeds from those of you that can't afford to and that are willing to uh, some more support, you know, platforms like this, which are to helping to continue our ability to bring forth truth in the manner that we do, that you can also purchase access to the archives for just $4.95 a month. Uh, just go to freedomslips.com. Click on the donate button, and there are things that you can purchase for your donations or just give outrightly. And know that we appreciate you and thank you in advance for doing so. All right, returning back to uh, John and receiving the vision of New Jerusalem descending out of the heavens, and that it would be New Jerusalem coming here to the earth that would be the place of the righteous for which uh, the millennial reign shall, the thousand year millennial reign that those that are accounted worthy shall dwell therein with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and that there is no need for the light of the Son on and on. I'll, I'll read that actually the final portion of Revelation because it fits in right along with all those things that I just read from the Apocalypse of Thomas and also which with which the Apocalypse of Peter will 
reveal as well. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God in her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are served are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever work, worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so again, it is at the end of the age, and with the wrath of God being poured out on the wicked, that the earth is destroyed and uh, prepared. There will be a new heaven and a new earth for the coming of Christ before he actually places his foot uh, upon the earth, that he will destroy all those that have amassed against him. And then when the earth is destroyed, then... All things will be made new. The earth will be like a virgin bride. And then cometh the bridegroom. And then new Jerusalem also shall descend out of the heavens. All, everybody will be brought back to their bodies. And then everybody will be brought before Christ as he takes his judgment seat. And that will be the separation of the harvest with regard to the tares and the wheat. And then those that are numbered and counted worthy to be among the elect, those will go into New Jerusalem and be allowed that thousand years of rest for what will be Sabbath. Because a day is as a thousand years. And this particular day that we're speaking of will be the seventh day. And it will be that thousand years of rest. And then Satan will be loosed once more. And then we have the second death. Where there will be no more suffering forevermore that we will enter into an eternal age. And then Satan and death and evil and all the New World Order elites and all those that joined him in opposition of Christ, they will be eradicated, annihilated as if they had never been. All right, we're going into the apocalypse of Peter. It says... Many of them shall be false prophets and shall teach ways and diverse doctrines of perdition, and they shall become sons of perdition. And then shall God come upon my faithful ones that hunger and thirst and are afflicted and prove their souls in this life and shall judge the sons of iniquity. Remember where it says in Scripture that uh, those that are worthy shall judge the angels, even the angels? It's speaking about the fallen ones and those that did rebel against the Most High God and that joined Lucifer, the one-third of the angels of the Most High, which joined him in rebellion. It is we, those that coming into the flesh and that proving our worth and that being been redeemed by Christ as Savior and Messiah, we will inherit the ordinances which they abandoned. And those angels which were cast down, exiled, and cast out, and the watchers which left their first estate and their place of habitation, it is humanity and those which um, 
it is we, you know, those God willing that are numbered amongst the elect that will be glorified and brought back into their bright nature and that being seated with Christ as judge and being an advisor unto him, that will be part of the process of judging the angels, as it says here in the script. And the Lord added and said, Let us go unto the mountain and pray. And going with him, we, the twelve disciples, besought him that he would show us one of our righteous brethren that had departed out of the world, that we might see what manner of men that are in, they are in their form, and take courage and encourage also the men that should hear us. And as we prayed, suddenly there appeared two men standing before the Lord, to the east upon whom we were not able to look, for there issued from their countenance a ray as of the sun, and their raiment was shining so as the eye of man never saw the light, for no mouth is able to declare, nor heart to conceive the glory wherewith they were clad and the beauty of their countenance, whom when we saw we were aston astonished, for their bodies were whiter than any snow and redder than any rose, and the redness on them was mingled with the whiteness, and in the word I am not able to declare their beauty. For their hair was curling and flourishing, flowery, and fell comely about their countenances and their shoulders like a garland woven of nard and various flowers of like a rainbow in the air, such was their comeliness. We then, seeing the beauty of them, were astonished. It says astonished, and I, I guess it's supposed to be astonished. At them, for they appeared suddenly, and I drew near to the Lord and said, Who are these? He said to me, These are your righteous brethren, whose appearance ye did desire to see. And I said unto him, And where are all the righteous? Or of what sort is the world wherein they are, and possess this glory? And the Lord showed me a very great region outside this world, exceedingly bright with light, and the air of that place illuminated with the beams of the sun, and the earth of itself flowering with blossoms that fade not, and full of spices and plants, fair flowering and incorruptible, and hearing and bearing blessed fruit. And so great was the blossom that the odor thereof was born thence even unto us. And the dwellers in that place were clad with the raiment of shining angels, and their raiment was like unto their land. And the angels ran round about them there. And the glory of them that dwelt there was all equal. And with one voice they passed the Lord God, rejoicing in that place. The Lord saith unto us, This is the place of your leaders, the high priests, the righteous men. And I saw also another place over against that one, very squalid, and it was a place of punishment. And they that were punished, and the angels that punished them, had their raiment dark according to the air of that place. And some that were there hanging by their tongues, and these were they that blasphemed the way of righteousness. And under them was laid fire, flaming and tormenting them. And there was a great lake full of flaming mire wherewith in were certain men that turned away from righteousness, and angels, tormentors, were set over them. There's a whole portion on Sheol and the, you know, describing it in great detail. So I'm going to skip all that because I want to go to the next portion where it's specific to the resurrection and to the second coming. And so it says, And he, Peter, pondered thereon that he might perceive the mystery of the Son of God, the merciful and lover of mercy, 
And when the Lord was seated upon the Mount of Olives, his disciples came unto him. And we besought and entreated him severely and prayed him, saying unto him, Declare unto us what are the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world, that we may perceive and make the time of thy coming and instruct them that come after us, unto whom we perceive the word of thy gospel and whom we set over in thy church that they, when they hear it, may take heed to themselves and mark the time of thy coming. And so again, this is exactly just like Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, and the Apocalypse of Thomas. Except for it's Peter, which, you know, he was made the head of the church. All right, continuing. And our Lord answered us, saying, Take heed that no man deceive you, and that ye be not doubters, and serve other gods. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. Believe them not, neither draw near unto them. For the coming of the Son of Man shall not be plain, but as the lightning that shineth from the east unto the west, so will I come upon the clouds of heaven with a great host and in my majesty with my cross going before my face will I come in my majesty shining sevenfold more than the sun will I come in my majesty with all my saints mine angels my holy angels and my father shall set a crown upon mine head that I may judge the quick and the dead and recompense every man according to his works. Remember, even Christ said in Revelation, remember from whence thou art fallen, and do the first works. So yes, works are a, a great portion of the determination of whether we are to be counted and numbered with the elect. And as is mentioned in the books of life because it is those works which are positive and that are beneficial to the kingdom that are revealed and that um, bear one as to be counting and numbered with the elect. And ye, take ye the likeness thereof, learn a parable from the fig tree. So soon as the shoot thereof is come forth and the twigs grown, the end of the world shall come. Very important because here it says that know ye the parable of the fig tree, that when you see the shoot thereof is come forth, the twigs grown, that then the end of the world shall come. And so the end is connected with the parable of the fig tree, which here it says, And I, Peter, answered and said unto him, Interpret unto me concerning the fig tree, whereby we shall perceive it, for throughout all its days doth the fig tree send forth shoots, and every year it bringeth forth its fruit for its master. What then meaneth the parable of the fig tree? We know it not. And so what an awesome thing that Christ here revealing the parable of the fig tree and it being connected to the end of the world, a simple man such as Peter and the only one of you know all the apostles ask him what do you mean by the parable of the fig tree we know it not because it's critical this parable in Matthew 24 Mark 13 and Luke 21 and the apocalypse of Thomas and the apocalypse of Peter it's critical 
because it's the blooming of the fig tree which is connected to the end of the age. And so Peter asked him to explain it. And the master, Lord, answered and said unto me, Understandest thou not that the fig tree is the house of Israel? Even as a man that planted the fig tree in his garden, and it brought forth no fruit, and he sought the fruit thereof many years, and when he found it not, he said to the keeper of his garden, Root up this fig tree, that it make not our ground to be unfruitful. And the gardener said unto God, Suffer us to rid it of weeds, and to dig the ground round about it, and water it. If then it bear not fruit, we will straightway remove its roots out of the garden, and plant another in place of it. Hast thou not understood that the fig tree is the house of Israel? And so basically he's telling you here that it is Israel, the children of Israel, the seed of promise. Uh, the generations and those 12 tribes that were born unto Abraham, the father of the Hebrews, that Jacob, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes that came from them, they are the house of Israel, and they are what you know inherited the nation, the house of Israel, the nation state of Israel. And yes, I know it was a Rothschild creation. I know that the New World Order elites worked to bring forth the Zion, Zionist movement and that they were the ones that even promising uh, the Balfour Declaration with the British that if they got America involved in the war that you know they would be given Palestine. Yes, I know all these things, but still it fulfills prophecy. And that even the Old Testament uh, prophets spoke about how Israel would be given their land back, that they would receive it again at the end of days. And so that's what is being spoken about here. All right, so. Verily I say unto thee, when the twigs thereof have sprouted forth in the last days, then shall fain Christ come and awake expectation saying i am the christ that am now come into the world and when they israel shall perceive the wickedness of their deeds they shall turn away after them and deny him whom our fathers did praise even the first christ whom they crucified and therein sinned a great sin but when the deceiver is but this deceiver is not the Christ. So he's telling you that the Antichrist will come forth when the blooming of the fig tree happens, when Israel comes forth as a nation again, that they will be looking for a false Messiah and that they will accept the Antichrist just as they rejected Christ who came in the flesh during what led to the destruction of the temple during the time of the Romans. And so he's telling you here, they're going to accept a false Christ. And when they reject him, he shall slay with the sword and there shall be many martyrs. So they will accept him, but then the, you know, uh, many will know that he's a false Christ. Because he's going to murder, he's going to deceive, he's going to slaughter. And much of the world, not just Israel, will bow down to the Antichrist and accept an alien God as Savior Messiah. But that this being will be a false Christ. And that he will begin to judge and persecute the saints. Which will be one of the signs that he is the false Christ. And when they reject him, he shall slay with the sword, and there shall be many martyrs. Then shall the twigs of the fig tree, that is the house of Israel, shoot forth. Many shall become martyrs at his hand. Here's another part, the two witnesses. Enoch and Elias shall be sent to teach them that this is the deceiver which must come into the world and do signs and wonders to deceive. 
And so this is the fulfillment of Revelation 12. I mean, Revelation 11, because Enoch and Elijah are the two witnesses of Revelation 11. They are the ones that, not having ever succumbed to death, will be killed at the end of days and will for the first time die and lay in the streets of you know Jerusalem for three and a half days, which is also equivalent to what will be the reign of the Antichrist during the second half, what is referenced in Scripture as the Great Tribulation. That it is then that they will come forth to warn because you know the the end is near, and the um, the time of reprieve, and the time to repent, and the time to accept Christ as Savior and Messiah is almost over. And so they will be, you know, like the the final chance in the midnight hour. Um, they will warn the world one final time this is not the Messiah he is a deceiver he is the Antichrist believe him not and accept the true Christ Yeshua as Messiah and through him accept the grace of salvation that comes with him being the true Christ and having the keys of life and death, and being the authority over death and life everlasting. All right, continuing. And therefore shall they that die by his hand be martyrs, and shall be reckoned among the good and righteous martyrs who have pleased God in their life. And he showed me in his right hand the souls of all men, and on the palm of his right hand, the image of that which be accomplished at the last day, and how the righteous and the sinners shall be separated, and how they do that do that are upright in heart, and how the evildoers shall be rooted out unto all eternity. So again, here, which shall be accomplished at the last day, how the righteous and the sinners shall be separated. So it's on the last day, the wrath of God poured out on the wicked. And the earth is destroyed. The stars of the uh, the stars come crashing down to the earth and help to set it ablaze. And then we have uh, the harvest. Continuing, we beheld how the sinners wept in great affliction and sorrow, until all that saw it with their eyes wept, whether righteous or angels, and he himself also. So, you know, in Second Peter it says about the last days and the scoffers, and about how Christ is long-suffering, because he wants no one to perish. And yet, now that the time has passed, and those that rejected him can no longer have part in salvation. Everybody cries. Everybody weeps for the lost because he knows that he's going to have to judge them. And so it hurts his heart because these are his children. And yet the angels that rebelled and those that sided with the New World Order they made their choice. They rejected him. They were scoffers. They believed not in judgment. They did not accept that there would be repercussions to their actions and that judgment would ever come. They believed themselves above the law. And for that, it cost them everything and I asked him and I said unto him Lord suffer me to speak that word concerning the sinners it were better for them if they had not been created 
And the Savior answered and said unto me, Peter, wherefore speakest thou thus, that not to have been created were better for them? Thou resistest God. Thou wouldest not have been more compassion than he for his image. For he hath created them, and brought them forth out of not being. Now, because thou hast seen the lamentation which shall come upon the sinners in the last days, therefore in thine heart you are troubled. But I will show thee their works, whereby they have sinned against the Most High. Behold now what shall come upon them in the last days, when the day of God and the day of the decision of the judgment of God cometh. From the east unto the west shall all the children of men be gathered together before my Father that liveth forever, and he shall command hell to open its bars of adamant and give up all that is therein. And the wild beasts and the fowl shall be commanded to restore all the flesh that they have devoured, because he willeth that men should appear. For nothing perished before God, and nothing is impossible with him, because all things are his. For all things come to pass on the day of decision, on the day of judgment, at the word of God. And as all things were done when he created the world and commanded all that is therein, and it was done, even so shall it be in the last days, for all things are possible with God. And therefore saith he in the scripture, Son of man, prophesy upon the several bones, and say unto the bones, Bone unto bone, in joints, sinew, nerves, flesh and skin and hair, thereon, and soul and spirit. And soul and spirit shall the great Uriel give them at the commandment of God. For him hath God set over the rising again of the dead at the day of judgment. Behold and consider the corns of wheat that are sown in the earth, as things dry and without soul do men sow them in the earth, and they live again and bear fruit, and the earth restoreth them as a pledge entrusted unto it. And this that dieth, that is sown as seed in the earth, and shall become alive and be restored unto life, is man. How much more shall God raise up on the day of decision them that believe in him and are chosen of him, for whose sake he made the world. In all things shall the earth restore on the day of decision, for it also shall be judged with them, and the heaven with it. And this shall come at the day of judgment upon them, that have fallen away from faith in God, and that have committed sin. Floods, cataracts of fire shall be let loose, and darkness and obscurity shall look up, up and clothe and veil the whole world. And the waters shall be changed and turned into coals of fire, and all that is in them shall burn, and the sea shall become fire. Under the heaven shall be a sharp fire that cannot be quenched, and floweth to fulfill the judgment of wrath. And the stars shall fly in pieces by flames of fire, as if they had not been created, and the powers and the firmament of heaven shall pass away, for the lack of water shall be as though they had not been, and the lightnings of heaven shall be no more, and by their enchantment they shall affright the world. The heaven shall turn to lightning, and the lightning thereof shall affright the world. The spirits also of the dead bodies shall be like unto them, and shall become fire at the commandment of God. And so soon as the whole creation dissolveth, the men that are in the east shall flee unto the west and to the east, that are in the south shall flee to the north, and they that are in the south, and in all places shall the wrath of a fearful fire overtake them, and an unquenchable flame driving them shall bring them unto the judgment of wrath unto the stream of unquenchable fire that floweth 
flaming with fire, and when the waves thereof part themselves, one from another burning, there shall be a great gnashing of teeth among the children of men. Then shall they all behold me coming upon an eternal cloud of brightness, and the angels of God that are with me shall sit, and I shall sit upon the throne of my glory at the right hand of my heavenly Father, and he shall set the crown upon my head. And when the nations behold it, they shall weep every nation apart. Then shall he command them to enter into the river of fire, while the works of every one of them shall stand before them, to every man according to his deeds. As for the elect that have done good, they shall come unto me and not see death by the devouring fire. But the unrighteous, the sinners, and the hypocrites shall stand in the depths of darkness that shall not pass away, and their chastisement is the fire, and angels bring forward their sins and prepare for them a place wherein they shall be punished for every one according to his transgression. Now I'm going to skip just a little bit because there's a whole long portion about the different um, decisions and the different behaviors and the different sins that different people committed and the judgments which come upon them and, you know, how they deserve it. You know, it's basically the tares uh, and what they did to be condemned. But I'm going to go to the part, um, the next part, which is about the righteous. Uh, let me skip down just a little bit. It's a very long portion. Okay, here we go. Now this is just like Adam when he and his righteous descendants were taken up to heaven and they were baptized in the Arturusian lake by Michael the archangel. It speaks about this same baptism happening to us, God willing, those that are numbered with the elect at the end of days. It says this, Then will I give unto mine elect and righteous the washing, baptism, and the salvation for which they have besought me in the field of Grosha, Archuriusia, where the soul of Adam is, was washed in it, which is also called Anaslegia Elysium. They shall adorn with flowers the portion of the righteous, and I shall go. I shall rejoice with them. I will cause the peoples to enter into mine everlasting kingdom and show them the eternal things whereon I have made them to set their hope even I and my Father which is in heaven. I have spoken this unto thee, Peter, and declared it unto thee. Go forth, therefore, and go unto the land or city of the west and enter into the vineyard which I shall tell thee of, in order that by the sickness and the sufferings of the Son who is without sin, the deeds of corruption may be sanctified. As for thee, thou art chosen according to the promise which I have given thee. Spread thou therefore my gospel throughout all the world in peace. Verily, men shall rejoice. My word shall be the source of hope and of life. And then suddenly shall the world be ravished. And my Lord Jesus Christ, our King, said unto me, let us go into the holy mountain. And his disciples went with him praying. And behold, there... Oh, sorry, this is a repeat. I'm going to skip that portion. There's a repeat of this particular section, but... All right, I'm going to skip down to now... Because um, there's two texts. 
Well, actually, there's several manuscripts of the Apocalypse of Peter, and they they vary slightly, but I'm not going to read that aspect. I'm going to share with you uh, some more prophecy. This is actually from the Cave of Treasures. It says this. The heavens will be prevented from letting fall rain, and the earth from producing germs and plants. And the earth shall remain like iron through drought, and the heavens like brass. Then will the son of perdition appear of the seed and of the tribe of Dan, and he will show deluding phantasms and lead astray the world. For the simple will see the lepers cleansed, the blind with their eyes open, and the paralytic walking, the devils cast out, the sun which he looks upon it becoming black, the moon when he commands it becoming changed, and the trees putting forth fruit from their branches, and the earth making roots to grow. He will show deluding phantasms of this kind, but he will not be able to raise the dead. He will go into Jerusalem and will sit upon a throne in the temple, saying, I am the Christ, and he will be borne aloft by legions of devils like a king and a lawgiver, naming himself God and saying, I am the fulfillment of the types and the parables. He will put an end to prayers and offerings as if it is his appearance. It is at his appearance. Prayers are to be abolished, and men will not need sacrifices and offerings along with him. He becomes a man incarnate by a married woman of the tribe of Dan. When this son of destruction becomes a man, he will be made a dwelling place for devils, and all satanic workings will be perfected in him. There will be gathered together with him all the devils and all the hosts of the Indians, and before all the Indians and before all men will the mad Jewish nation believe in him, saying, This is the Christ, the expectation of the world. The time of the error of the Antichrist will last two years and a half, but others say three years and six months. And when everyone is standing in despair, then will Elijah, Elias, come from paradise and convict the deceiver, and turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, and he will encourage and strengthen the hearts of the believers. So that's a portion from the Cave of Treasures, and you know it fits along with other aspects of Scripture, as I've read. The coming of Enoch and Elijah as the Revelation 11 witnesses. And it says that at the end of days, it won't rain, that water will be withheld, that it won't rain for a very long time. And so that, you know, the, the earth becomes hard like iron. And those that are here, the, the wicked and those not written into the books of life, they will dig deep into the earth seeking water but won't find it. So, you know, this will be part of the wrath of God um, poured out on the wicked as well. And I think, you know, some of the chemtrailing and all that will have part to do with all that as well. All right, I'm going to read from Second Ezra now, prophecy from those texts. All right, give me just a second. I'm going to make the text larger so it's easier to see. All right. There's many different books that specific to our being the fig tree generation and that cover the end of days that I wanted to share. And so this is some of that. I'll probably be able to do one final, one other show connected to some of these teachings to tie it all together for you. 
All right, it says this, second Ezra. Or actually, I think this is one of the books of Baruch. It says, for behold, the days come and the books shall be opened in which are written the sins of all those who have sinned. And again, also the treasuries in which the righteous of all those who have been righteous in creation is gathered. For it shall come to pass at that time that you shall see in the many that are with you the long suffering of the Most High, which has been throughout all generations who has been long suffering towards all who have been who are born alike those who sin and those who are righteous and i answered and said but behold o lord no one knows the number of those things which have passed nor yet of those things which are to come for i know indeed that which has befallen us but what will happen to our enemies i know not and when you will visit your works. And he answered and said unto me, You too shall be preserved till that time, till that sign which the Most High will work for the inhabitants of the earth in the end of days. This therefore shall be the sign. When a stupor shall seize the inhabitants of the earth, and they shall fall into many tribulations, and again when they shall fall into great torment, and it will come to pass when they say in their thoughts, by reason of their much tribulation, the mighty one doth no longer remember the earth. Yes, it will come to pass when they abandon hope that the time will then awake. And he answered and said unto me, Into twelve parts is that time divided, and each one of them is reserved for that which is appointed for it. In the first part there shall be the beginning of commotions. And in the second part there shall be slayings of the great ones. And in the third part the fall of many by death. The fourth part the sending of the sword. The fifth part famine and the withholding of rain. The sixth part earthquakes and terrors. The eighth part a multitude of specters and attacks of the Shadim, which are the demons or devils. And in the ninth part, the fall of fire. The tenth part, raping and much oppression. The eleventh part, wickedness and unchastity. And in the twelfth part, confusion from the mingling together of all those things aforesaid. For these parts of that time are reserved and shall be mingled one with another and minister one to another. For some shall leave out some of their own and receive in its stead from others and some complete their own and that of others so that those may not understand who are upon the earth in those days that this is the consummation of the times. Nevertheless, whoever understands shall then be wise. For the measure and reckoning of that time are two parts a week of seven weeks. So here again it tells you the you know, same thing, that it will be two parts, and the seven weeks are equal to seven years. And I answered and said, It is good for a man to come and behold, but it is better that he should not come lest he fall. But I will say this also. Will he who is incorruptible despise those things which are corruptible? And whatever befalls in the case of those things which are corruptible, so that he might look only to those things which are not corruptible. But if, O oh Lord, those things shall assuredly come to pass, which you have foretold to me. So do you show this also unto me. If indeed 
I have found grace in your sight. Is it in one place or in one of the parts of the earth that those things are to come to pass? Or will the whole earth experience them? And he answered and said unto me, Whatever will then befall will befall the whole earth. Therefore all who live will experience them. For at that time I will protect only those who are found in those selfsame days in this land. And it shall come to pass when all is accomplished that was to come to pass in those parts, that the Messiah shall then begin to be revealed. And behemoth shall be revealed from his place, and Leviathan shall ascend from the sea. Those two great monsters which are created on the fifth day of creation, and shall have kept until that time, and they that shall be for food, for all that are left, the earth also shall yield its fruit ten thousand fold, and on each vine there shall be a thousand branches. And each branch shall produce a thousand clusters, and each cluster produce a thousand grapes, and each grape a thousand core of wine. And those who have hungered shall rejoice. Moreover also they shall behold marvels every day. For wind shall go forth from before me to bring every morning the fragrance of aromatic fruits, and at the close of the day clouds distilling the dew of health. And it shall come to pass at that selfsame time that the treasury of manna shall again descend from on high, and they will eat of it in those years, because there are they who have come to the consummation of time. I think we are to the end of the show. We'll pick up next week with the resurrection final sentence and it shall come to pass after these things when the time of the advent of the messiah is fulfilled that he shall return in glory the next portion will be on the resurrection uh, we'll pick that up uh next week tomorrow um two of my friends will be joining me on truth frequency radio so do catch us there I appreciate all of you, and thank you for taking the time to join us and to listen in this evening. As always, I'm grateful for your patronage. God bless all of you. And I hope that you do take these times seriously and that you prepare for those things that are coming upon the world. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message.